morning. Good, that was a good response. Thank you. It's good to see you this morning. Good to have you here on this beautiful Sabbath day. And this morning, we, uh, we've got just a few announcements before we go into our worship hour. Uh, most of you know that uh, Elder Dennis Preeby is here with us this weekend. Uh, he's going to be here for most of the day today. And you have actually a, a couple of flyers uh, that kind of give you an idea of what the schedule is going to look like. But he has a couple of things he wanted to share with you about today, so I'm going to ask him to come up so that he can get those uh, given to you, and then he can get back in with the group that's going to come in just a few minutes. Thank you, Pastor. Um, when I was at uh, Amazing Facts up in Frederick, Maryland, where our headquarters used to be before we moved out to Sacramento, California, um, I heard the name Kernersville a number of times. And uh, Joe Cruz would tell us about his early days here. So this is a great time for me to come back to a place I've never been to and learn a little history about the one who called me into this ministry. All right, just a couple of things that we want to make very clear here. There is a change in uh, today's schedule on the middle page of your bulletin uh, where it says 5.30 p.m. God's Amazing Creatures, Matthew Preby. Matthew is my son. That time is an error. It should be 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock is going to be the time for that meeting. 7 o'clock instead of 5.30. So you might want to note that and uh, make sure you can come back for that meeting. Okay. Um, right now, we want to, and I'm thinking, I'm looking for Matthew and Delise. Uh, they're not in here yet. We want to give you a copy of the little magazine called The Inside Report that Amazing Facts publishes on a regular basis, about four times a year. And so we want to make sure that you have that in your hands, but we'll do that in a moment. But the, right, the thing to do right now that we want to do is let you know about this evening's meeting couple of things that are important about it, and Matthew will have a little more to say about it. Um, the meeting will be, as I said, at 7 o'clock. It will be completely different from all of the other meetings of the afternoon and this morning. Uh, Matthew's presentation, he's a naturalist, and he goes out and studies animals and tries to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, and all over the country, he's looking for strange little critters. So this is what he's uh, uh, going to be talking about tonight. The issue is very simple. What did the animals tell us about creation versus evolution? Not scientific information, just an understanding the whole issues of, of salvation. Here's Matthew right now. So I'm going to let him tell you what he's going to be talking about tonight. And uh, do we have the papers, the, the handouts? All right, raise your hand if you would like a sample copy of the inside report and it'll be placed in your hand. Good morning everyone. In your bulletin you have several inserts, one of which is the schedule for today's meetings. Um, that is uh, the correct is for uh, the meetings but not the times, um, so we're going to be adjusting that as we go. Um, the afternoon meetings will take longer than the uh, uh, scheduled times here, so my meeting will be starting later than is scheduled here. We don't have an exact time, but it's going to be around 7 o'clock, probably when we're starting. And so that will be going from, sundown, uh, from 7 o'clock till sundown. We'll be ending directly at sundown tonight for the evening vespers. Now in the uh, bulletin you have a, another insert that deals with that. The first one on for the, with the pictures on one side is talking about our program this evening. As he said, it's going to be dealing with creation and evolution, but from a point of view that you probably haven't uh, thought about before, the animals are giving evidence that evolution or creation is true. They're giving evidence by the ways that they're built and the ways that they behave. And if we can use that information to share our faith with others. I'm not here to convince you that creation is true, that God made the earth in six days. That's not my job. You already know that. What we're going to be doing tonight is giving you the practical information you can use to share your faith with others. Because when you tell your friends and neighbors and family that you believe that the, Bible, that the creation was made 6,000 years ago and that God made it all, and they ask you to prove it, and you point to Genesis, are they going to believe that if they don't already believe in Genesis? 
They need something else, and that's what I give you. It's, I give you practical, useful scientific information that is well-grounded uh, and well-established that shows that our faith is not based on fantasy but reality. And so we're going to look at animals. We're going to look at animals on the screen that we've taken pictures of, and we're going to be looking at animals that you've heard of, and we're going to be looking at animals that you've never heard of, because I tend to focus on unusual animals. And each animal we look at will give us information that destroys the theory of evolution. It will show us that there is no possibility that evolution is true. So it's going to be fun, it's going to be entertaining, but it's also important because it's going to give you practical information. Now my wife does kids programs, but I do the adult programs, so tonight's program is for adults because it's very useful scientific information. We're also going to be talking about animals that you have in your backyard, and the last animal we'll be talking about is one animal that you're so familiar with that you will probably take it for granted as being ordinary, but it actually is one of the most amazing testimonies to our faith. Thank you, Matthew. And just a couple more, if you've got your flyers handy there, just a reminder, Friday, June 25, uh, there's going to be a young adult Vespers. And so hopefully, if you're interested in that, you can follow through on that information. We also have on June 23rd, uh, there's going to be Meet Me in the Park. It's going to be a time of fellowship at the Triad Park. Uh, the times and everything are listed there. So take a look at that flyer and pay attention to when you're going to be able to join your church family for a fun outing. Then we also have on the last weekend of this month, we have I Forever Do a marriage seminar that's going to begin on Friday evening and go through Sabbath and finish on Sunday morning. All of the dates and times are on your flyer for that as well. And then the last one that we have that I um, want you to be aware of is we have Vacation Bible School coming up July 8 through 12, and uh, it's called Thunder Island this year, and Cassidy wanted me to let you know that they're really excited about it, and also they want you to know that that next page that you have there is if you would like to volunteer to help out with that. So if you would, you can just um, fill in on those slots that you think you might be interested in helping out with. You can get that back to Cassidy and she also wanted me to let you know that if you have been in Vacation Bible School, but you've aged out, that's an interesting concept, but if you've aged out of Vacation Bible School and you would like to help out with that, she'd really love to have you be involved as well. Those other announcements you find in your bulletin are pretty much our weekly announcements, so I think you can figure those out for yourself. Again, welcome this morning. We're glad to have you here, and I know you're in store for a blessing.
Sarawat, you may be seated. Before we enter our prayer time, there is one last announcement. For those that are joining us in prayer meeting, it's a great time. We have it on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. But prayer meeting this week will not be in the classroom area. It will be here in the church, in the sanctuary area. So please join us 7 p.m. Wednesday here for prayer meeting here in the church sanctuary. This version, this week, we will not be streaming. Um, it will not be on Zoom, but following next week, we'll be back in the classrooms and it'll be on Zoom again. But this coming week will be right here in the sanctuary. So please join us 7 p.m. All right, now is the time for us where we get to corporately seek the Lord in prayer. It's a fantastic opportunity that we can boldly come before the throne of grace. There are a number of prayer requests um, that were written up in the front. We want to think of um, Ellen Adams, daughter of Ima. Uh, Mr. Otofsky, he's currently in the ICU after a serious car accident. We want to think of Donna Marie, who's um, grieving. We want to think of Dr. Mark Nelson, who is um, experiencing health issues. And we want to think of Joshua Farmsworth, um, who is suffering from Parkinson's. Are there any silent requests? The Lord sees each of your hands. We have a tradition here, so for those that would have a special burden on your heart or a special prayer request, you could join me here up front at the altar here and we will pray together. Or uh, For those that would prefer to kneel as far as possible, please do so at your pew. Father in heaven, we come before you on this Sabbath morning, praising your name, acknowledging your goodness, loving your love, and asking that you will indwell within us that we may show that love to others. Lord, it is a beautiful Sabbath day, and the blessings provided to us, both great and small, we can't underestimate. We thank you for bringing us here that we may worship you today. We thank you for the Sabbath that was given to us so we may have time to set apart and recognize you and remember you as our creator. Lord, even though today is wonderful, we still live in a sinful planet. And there are things and issues, health issues, finance issues, marriage issues. There are special prayer requests that we mentioned today as well. Lord, help us. We are incapable of solving these problems, but you are. We know you can heal. We know you can provide mental health. We know you can provide emotional stability. We know you can provide finances. So Lord, we pray that you will intervene in accordance with your will. And Lord, where we fail, where we don't believe, we pray that you will help our unbelief. Lord, as we go into the church service today, we pray and welcome the Holy Spirit. Be with us, indwell with us, guide us into all truth and be with our speaker in a special way. 
Lord, be with each silent request as well. And Lord, be with us, especially on this Sabbath, but even also throughout the week, we pray in Jesus' name. Do you hear me? Wow. Glad to see you today. So uh, we decided to be one more time in Kernersville before we are leaving summer to the turmoil part of the world. We are going to be in Romania, just south of Ukraine and just north of Gaza. And in the I had a friend that came here to us in the morning. We are gathered here around the piano. Said, are you going to do the music today? He said, yeah, by God's grace. He said, I'm glad. So that's the very, very first reason. From time to time, we put aside a Sabbath for Kernersy because we know that somebody is going to be blessed. Not everybody. But we'll do the hard effort to involve you today to be part of the singing and have the song service a nice experience for each one of you. So, again, we have some young people that are, came back from the college. Some of them are leaving to the college. Some of them are still remaining here for the next year. So, are you committed to sing with us today? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Cole. You always being a support for every worship team. So, saying that, follow the, follow the, um, follow the words. We can combine a couple of songs here and there. Um, we had a new song that we wanted to propose to you, but knowing that the, store, the, the, the program is very busy today, we'll let them from, for the next school year sometime. We'll go to that. So sing your heart out. Jesus. 
Amen. You may be seated. It's investment time. This is a time for us to invest in the cause that we most dearly love. Follow the news at all. The stock market goes up and it goes down and it goes all around. And in the end, <clears throat> I would say those investments in the world are all losers. But in God's kingdom, the investments we make there will always turn out to return more than we could ever imagine we could invest. And we invest locally here through our local budget offering and their tithes and offerings to the wider world church. And I, if you're asking my advice, I advise that we invest in heaven because that's where we'll gain the greatest interest in our investment. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you have given us the opportunity to put our whole heart, our whole energies, our whole lives into the cause that you have invested your son in that has paid and made our investment the great, wonderful thing that it is something that we cannot lose on, Father. I pray that you'd bless each giver this morning. Bless those, Father, that are putting their hearts and their prayers into the work, so that they may not have all the funds you can bless way beyond what we put in. You just need our hearts. Father, I pray that you'd bless this offering and the tithes that will greatly increase. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
finders for the ministry and the children's work there. Children, you can keep uh, collecting the money, but just before we do the children's story, we're going to do the prayer of dedication for the fathers. So, children, you can come on, but then we will have you to have a seat up here. Um, so just before the story, fathers, start preparing to come on down for the prayer of dedication for our fathers. So dig deep into your pockets and give to the children. So we're going to just go ahead with the children's story, and then after the children's story, we'll do the prayer of dedication for the fathers. So children, come on and have a seat. We will have the children's story, and then fathers, we'll have the prayer of dedication. Sabbath, boys and girls. It's clap. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> I'm glad to see every one of you guys up here. So um, I'm going to read to you our story for the Sabbath, okay? So I would like you to listen and let me know how you feel about it when we finish, okay? All right. There was once a young boy who grew up fine, but without his dad's presence all the time. His dad's nature of work did not give him the privilege to be with his dad while he was growing up. His dad was a seafarer. Do you guys know what a seafarer does? What is a seafarer? Well, a seafarer is someone who works in a ship, and he is always out in the sea. And so he only gets to see his dad for a month every year. They did not get the chance to do a lot of things together. Occasions such as going to school, going to soccer practice, playing basketball, receiving his medal in school, or even camping, his father was never present. Then one day, the young boy, he was about eight years old then, he asked his dad, Papa, are you going back to work tomorrow? When will I see you again? Then the dad replied, um, Yes, son, I have to. It's about time. I will be back when you are about to turn nine years old. You are always away, replied the son. I won't see you again for so long. His dad answered, Well, son, I'm just being a father. Study hard and be good to your mom. And so his father left for work. So this has been going on, routinely going on, 
for the boy and his father. The father goes to work, works in the ship, sails for a very long time, then comes back to stay for a very short while with, to be with him and his family, and then goes back to work again. And so very rarely would the boy see his dad. But in return, the boy had lots of toys. He can buy whatever he want. He had fine clothes and shoes to wear. He had new video games, but he never had time to spend with his dad. The son finished high school, and of course his father was never there in his graduation, as, as expected, but he received a fi very fine gift. Then the son said, Dad, I want to go to college. I want to be a pilot. He sounded so excited, but the father replied, no, son, I am getting old. I am going to retire soon, and we could be together. But I want you to be a physical therapist. Do you guys know what a physical therapist does? You forgot, well, I can tell you. A physical therapist is someone who helps people walk back again. They may have paralysis or may have broken bones. So they help people to walk back and to learn how to walk back again. However, the son did not agree of that first. Dad, I don't want to. I want to do things that I want, not things that you want for me to do. Why would you do that to me? The dad replied, I am just being a father. I want you to do that because I said so. Well, the son did not disobey his dad. And so he went to college, and he, there is only one thing in his mind, to finish school. The son's father is getting older and older and weaker, but the son does not realize that. Until the very sad news reached him from the shipping company where his father worked. His father and the entire crew of the cargo ship that they were working at was hijacked by pirates. The whole ship has gone missing, and no single crew member could be found. The son was devastated. Lots of efforts were made to search for the ship, but no one could be found. The ship has gone missing. The father has gone missing, and he was never found. And that is the end of our story. While we still have time, boys and girls, I'd like you or recommend to you to seize that time while you still have time to spend time with your dad. Your dad may be away, but there may be a phone call away. So give time to give them a call or spend time with them. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, you can go play board games together or clean, wash the car together because we can't hold time. We have our Heavenly Father who gave us two words to remember, just like our song said earlier today. Trust and obey, because he knows what's best for us. Jeremiah 29, 11 said, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Our Heavenly Father knows best. This is my prayer. And before you guys go back to your seats, I have something for you guys. You may want to keep that to yourself or grab one for your dads. It's, um, it's a keychain. Maybe you can give that to your daddies or keep one for your backpacks perhaps. You may go back to your seats whenever you can get these.
Well, this weekend we will be celebrating our fathers. So at this time, we'd like for all the fathers to come up. We just want to say a word of dedication over your lives that God will give you the strength to continue to be the father, to be the leader of your homes. You are very important in your home. You're very important in your community. You're very important in our church. You're very important in our world. So fathers, come on up at this time. Stand up here with me, all fathers. All fathers, look at all the fathers come forward. All the fathers, the young ones, the old ones, and not so old. I won't say that. But <laughs> so fathers, come on up. Wow, we have a lot of fathers, a lot of fathers. Amen. Let's say amen, ladies. Say amen for the fathers. Amen. Amen to the fathers. What a privilege that God has given you to be the fathers of your children. Now, I'm just curious, who has been a father for 20 years, at least 20, 30, 40? Anybody been a father for at least 50 years? 50, 50 years, wow, maybe you're our oldest father here. Amen, God bless you, God bless you. So men, why don't you lock arms we want to pray over your lives. We want to pray that God gives you strength to continue. We want to thank you for fathering our children, the ones you have in your home and the ones that come to church. We want to thank you so much that God has given you the strength. It's not easy being a father. Am I correct, fathers? Is it easy? Is it easy? No. It's not easy. You got to do this on your knees. You got to do this. On, if you want to be a successful father, you got to stay on your knees. So we're going to pray for you right now that God will bless you. If, if you have a father standing up here, raise your hand. If your father is standing up here, stand up. Let me see. If your father is up here, stand up. I see somebody waving. If your father is up here, stand up. Or your grandfather, your father or your grandfather, stand up. So as we pray, you remain standing. As we pray, you have a father, stand up. You have a father or grandfather. Okay, let's go further. If your husband is standing up here, why don't you stand? Father, grandfather, or your husband, you're standing in agreement that we are praying over these men. Look at these men of Kernersville. Take a good look at them. Take a good, let's take a look. Take a good look at them. These are our men. These are our men. It's nothing like a man. The world says we don't need you, but I'm here to tell you, we need you. You're important. We need you. You are important. Don't forget that. The world's trying to say we don't need them. I, they have this me movement, but I'm telling you now, as a girl child, we need you. We need your prayers. We need your protection, and we need them pockets. We need them wallets. Yes, we do. We need them wallets. So we're going to bow our heads. We're going to close our eyes. We're going to ask God to just bless you. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the privilege of fatherhood. We thank you for the responsibility that you've given to fathers to be the providers, to be the priests, to be the protectors of their homes. Though some of them may not have always done it right, so today we want to stand and ask that you would forgive them for wherever they may have slapped or wherever they may have lacked. We ask that you would cover them. We ask, Lord, that you would give them the strength to hold on. Lord, when they're feeling discouraged, help them to come to you. When they're tired and worn out, help them to come to you. When the ends are not meeting, help them to trust you. And Father, I thank you for them. I ask, Lord, that you would keep them, to give them the strength to keep on keeping on. Help them to be the example. Help them to be the leaders in their home, the leaders in their communities, the leaders in our church. And Lord, we ask that where they need to be forgiven, we ask that you forgive them. Fathers, take a moment right now and just ask God to forgive you for where you may have slacked. 
or where you may have lacked. Lord, I ask that you will accept this confession of these men today. I ask that your blood will cover them. Thank you for second chances. Thank you for third chances. And those of them who still have a wife, I pray that you would teach them how to love her, how to cherish her. And those who still have children in their homes, I pray that you will help them to be that godly example so they need not be the shame when you return. And Lord, your coming is soon. So until then, help these men to be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen, amen, and amen. Men, stand tall. Jesus loves you, and so do we. God bless you all. Amen. You may return to your seats. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is found in James 4, 17. And it reads, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Amen. Happy Sabbath.
just want to welcome Elder Dennis Prewe to our podium now. Good morning to each one. Trust you're having a good Sabbath day together. Just a couple of announcements right now. <clears throat> We're going to place in your hands a, uh, an outline that we'll be using today and is for your benefit. We're going to place at least one per family in your hands so you have it and you can take it home with you. So that will be coming your way right now as, and we hope we can cover everyone that is here. Just a couple of announcements. Number one, the evening meeting, the 7 o'clock meeting, that we've changed the time from 5.30 to 7, 7 o'clock meeting, will not be live streamed. It will only be seen here in this auditorium, in this sanctuary, because of copyright issues. So that meeting will not be live streamed as the others may be. So at 7 o'clock, it is here. Also, for those of you who received the little magazine from Amazing Facts, the Inside Report, um, if you would like to receive that magazine in your home, there is a little white card in the front cover of the magazine. Put your name and address clearly on that card and uh, give it to any one of us today. We'll make sure it gets on to Amazing Facts. So once again, if you want to receive this magazine in your home and be on the mailing list of Amazing Facts, fill out that white card and give it to us today. How are we doing? Just about everyone got a copy so far? Let's keep on going and see how far we can get. All right, our subject this morning is what is sin? What is sin? Friends, there are other topics in the Bible that are more fun to talk about than what is sin. But if we do not understand this subject correctly, we will not understand any part of the gospel correctly. This is really a crucial subject for you to study and understand. All right, do, do we have enough for everybody? Looks like we do. Great. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. So our subject this morning, what is sin? And um, there's a lot of confusion. Confusion in the Christian world. Confusion even, my friends, in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And we need to know, like I say, if we do not understand the subject of sin correctly, nothing else in the gospel will be clear. There, this is one of those subjects that is really important for us to understand. All right. Now you have your outline. Let's take a look. Number one, definitions. We need to define our terms so you know exactly what we're talking about. Original sin, definition A, subtitled sin as nature. What does that mean? That means that we are born with bad equipment. Yes, we are. And that means that that bad equipment condemns us. We are lost. We are condemned because of this bad equipment. I'll read one brief statement, one sentence to you that will let you know exactly what this teaches. Sinful man is not lost because he has committed sins, but because he is born of Adam and therefore stands condemned in him even before he commits sins of his own. So we are condemned, definition A says, because Adam sinned and we are his children, therefore we inherit his condemnation and his guilt. And we start life un unsaved and lost. All right, that's definition A. That is what most Christians believe. Definition B, sin as choice. Two parts to definition B. You must know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, and you must deliberately choose what is wrong. What is wrong? Not all mistakes that we make are sins. Sometimes we just fail to remember. Sometimes we don't get it just right in our thinking. Those are not sins. A sin is when God says something that we need to do or not do, and we deliberately disobey, knowing the difference between right and wrong. That is definition B. And so I'm going to share with you why I 
choose to believe the minority position, definition B, that sin is always, always a choice, never bad equipment, never an accident of birth, never something that just happens to us. Sin is choice. I've asked the question here, what is the difference between evil and guilt? Well, what are we talking about here? Evil is evil and guilt. Well, isn't it the same thing? No, it is not. Some of you have in your own homes a perfect illustration of the difference between evil and guilt in a little animal that you and I call a pet. It's a sweet little animal. It loves to be part of our family. It does things that are important to us. We've asked the question, are we sinners at birth? And we've said no. Are we sinners by choice? And I've said yes. So I want to share with you why I've taken this position. And there's the little animal, the little sweet cat that we have in our homes. Have you noticed, though, that when you let your sweet little cat outdoors, something changes in that little animal? All of a sudden, its whiskers are at full attention, its ears at full alert, because it's going out in your backyard to do what its ancestors did before we ever made it a pet. So what is it going out there to do? Well, your little cat has a fallen nature too. Did you know that? And it is following its nature. And its nature says, you're out here to catch and kill some little critter. That's not as strong as you. That can't run as fast as you. And you're out here to do your job. Okay. And you watch it all from your back porch. What do you see your cat doing when it catches that little mouse, that little gopher, that little something? What do you see your cat do? Quickly, humanely, and mercifully put it out of its suffering, right? Or you've been watching, haven't you? You've seen that little cat play, play with the mouse. Do you think the mouse considers it play? But your cat does, and your cat is wishing for all the time it has outdoors to find and kill slowly, painfully, that little animal that it has caught. What is your reaction to that? Great, good job, or... I wish it wouldn't do that to that little animal. It hasn't done anything to the cat. Why should it torture it literally to death? That's not right. I've watched that too in my backyard. And what do you do? What do you do when your sweet little cat comes marching up to your back door, feathers sticking out of every corner of its mouth, waiting to be praised for the great job it did in your backyard, got rid of one more of those nasty little songbirds that clutter up the place. What do you do? Do you hold a little trial right on your back porch? Do you get together a jury of people to decide guilt or innocence? Do you have a little jail cell prepared right over there in case the verdict is guilty? You don't do any of those things, do you? Why not? Your cat has just done something that is not part of God's plan, will not be part of God's plan in the future world, but right now in our world it has just done it, and you watched it all. No, you scold your cat a little bit. You threaten to put a bell around its neck, and you actually welcome that little killer back into your house. What you've just seen in your backyard we call evil. It's not part of God's plan. He didn't intend for animals to do that to each other. That is all a result of sin coming into this world. But it is a reality that is evil. It is part of an evil world. You and I live in an evil world. It is not the world that God designed. We're looking for a better one, aren't we? We want a better world that God can trust us with. And I know we want to live in that world. So there you have the difference between evil and guilt. Things that are negative or harmful, the blanks here for are for your benefit. You can fill them in if you wish. Things that are negative or harmful are evil, and but deliberately choosing wrong, that is guilt. 
to get bad equipment into your system. That's bad. That's evil. But no guilt is connected with that. So let's go to the Bible right now. Let's find out what God says. Genesis chapter 2, 17. God's first command to his first created beings on planet Earth. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. It is not obscure. It is not difficult to understand. It's plainly stated. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did they eat of the fruit of the tree? Did they die that day? In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Why not? Well, let's try another Bible text. Way at the other end of the Bible. I'm glad our Bible's a big one. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Revelation 13 verse 8. Now I'm reading from the King James Version. Some other versions handle this verse a little differently. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. That's Jesus Christ. And then it says something very interesting. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now wait a minute. How does that help us? He wasn't slain at the foundation of the world. That happened 4,000 years later. So what in the world is this talking about? Well, let's read a few more statements. These are from Bible Commentary, Volume 1, pages 1082 to 1085. Why was not the death penalty at once enforced in his case? That's the question. Did God's promise fail? No, because a ransom was found. God's only begotten Son volunteered to take the sin of men upon himself and to make an atonement for the fallen race. The instant, notice the words, the instant man accepted the temptations of Satan and did the very things that God had said he should not do, Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, Let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. Are you glad for that? Are you glad he stepped in immediately? One more. As soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. As soon as Adam sinned, the Son of God presented himself as surety for the human race with just as much power to avert the doom pronounced upon the guilty as when he died upon the cross of Calvary. So according to the statements we've read, when did Christ take Adam's punishment? As soon as he sinned. That's what our text said here. As soon as he sinned. As soon as there was what? There was a what? As soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. No loss of time at all. So what are we talking about here? Jesus Christ normally doesn't do that, does he? He stands at the door and knocks. And if we open the door, he will enter and sit down to eat with us. But in this case, he didn't wait for Adam and Eve to ask him in, did he? In fact, he had to search for Adam and Eve because they were hiding from him, right? So he had to go find them. They knew something was wrong, but they didn't know how serious it was yet. And so what is Christ doing at this point? Keep in mind one thing. We're not talking about Adam being saved or Eve being saved here. That is to become later. He is going to ask them to bring a lamb. And with his own hand, Adam is going to have to take the life of that innocent animal and plead for repentance. That's for salvation. This is not. This is something else here. If Adam and Eve would have died that day, where would you and I be? We would not exist, would we? Not one human being on this earth would exist because Adam and Eve were the human race. And if they were destroyed, the human race would be destroyed. And God would have to start over on another planet or whatever he would do, we're not told. So the reality is that this is God preventing the extinction of the human race. I'm pretty glad he did it. Yes, I know there's been a lot of suffering. There has been miserable evil being committed all around us and all around our world. We live in a very fortunate area 
that we have just a minimal part of that. But parts of this world are just a miserable, miserable place to live right now. And so evil is very real. It's very, it's very um, dominant right now. So Jesus Christ prevented extinction that day by stepping in and taking the penalty of Adam's sin upon himself. Yes, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And remember, he can see the future as Yahweh, as the Jesus that stepped into the garden that day. And he can experience in a way that you and I will never understand that death for 4,000 years before it happened. We're going to have that opportunity to talk to him about that in heaven. All right, what does that mean? Well, first of all, you know, I can give you a very simple definition of why I don't believe definition A, the majority position, that we're born sinners. That means if you believe definition A, that you and I are still paying for Adam's sin. We're condemned. We're lost. We're going to hell. We're being destroyed. And that means that this is all a part of paying for Adam's sin, every one of us. I believe, how about you, that when Jesus Christ pays a penalty, that penalty is done. I believe that when Jesus Christ paid for Adam's sin, that penalty was finished. And now we have a different reality to live under since Jesus did that. The last little sentence on the page. Every baby bor <clears throat> born <clears throat> is facing what? Well, it isn't condemnation, and it isn't destruction. Every baby that is born on this planet is born because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Every baby is born because Jesus died on a cross in Calvary and paid the penalty so that you and I don't have to pay that penalty again. Praise God for his mercy to the human race. And he's going to give us a chance to live forever. All right, to the next page, page two. I'm not going to read all of the Bible text. We'll select a few. John chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. John 9, 1 to 3. Very familiar story. Jesus and his disciples are walking along, and they come across a man that was blind from his birth. So the disciples must have known about this man because they knew he was blind from his birth, and that is not true of all blind people. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What the disciples are asking is, we know he's a sinner. Take a look at his eyes. He's being punished for someone's sin. Whose sin is it? Did his parents do something really bad, and he's being punished for their sin? Or uh, maybe, Lord, is it possible that you can sin before you are born in your mother's womb in that nine-month period? That's their question. Did this man himself s prepare for his, his punishment of blindness, or did his parents do that? And look at Jesus' answer in verse 3. Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. You've got your question all wrong, Jesus is saying. Don't assume by looking at his eyes that he's born a condemned, lost sinner going to hell. Don't make that assumption. That's what the disciples were assuming. Don't do that. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now ask him the question, how does Jesus take care of that man's problem? Does he hold out his hand and say, I forgive your blindness? Does Jesus say that? I don't read that in the word of God. Does the blind man's eyes need forgiveness? No. What do they need? Healing. They need recreation. They need to be able to see again. Just like our bodies need recreation. Every one of us need to be recreated. That's a different issue than forgiveness. Forgiveness is for guilt. So at this point, we've got to ask the question, what is going on? Let's be very sure. Turn with me to John chapter 5, where Jesus says in two verses things that seem to contradict each other. John 5, 24. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. According to Jesus, when can you have everlasting life? Sometime in the future, maybe? Or right now? If you believe that Jesus is your Savior, you have everlasting life. But wait a minute, look at verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead, really, the dead, shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. How can you have everlasting life and be dead at the same time? Does Jesus contradict himself? Or back in the Garden of Eden, did Jesus separate death into two parts? There's the part that we all face. There's the part that is the result of evil that things are not the way God intended for it to be. And so we've got to look at this more carefully. Sin, the sin that came into this earth because of Adam's decision, has two parts, not just one. It has evil and it has guilt. How do these result, how do these evil, the evil and guilt work out? Evil leads to the first death, the result of being born in an evil world. While guilt leads to hell, the second death, as the penalty for rebelling against God. Two different aspects of the sin that Adam and Eve brought into this world. Both of them having different results. Are you supposed to be afraid of dying the first death according to Jesus? Can you die in peace? Can you die knowing that, he, that you have, you have everlasting life? You'll sleep a little bit? So what? Can he wake you up out of sleep at any time that he wants to? And so here we have the results. Two aspects of sin that the Bible talks about in different language. How do we handle guilt? Well, by repentance. And our guilt is forgiven. That's what most of the Bible is about. Our guilt being forgiven on a daily basis. But evil, how is that going to be taken care of? And when is God going to take care of the evil in this world? Only, only when he returns. Do you have some things in your life, in your body, that you wish could be changed in your mind? To have a better mind, to have a better memory, to have a better thinking process? God is going to take care of that. Emotions are up and down, aren't they? And God will take care of that, too. He'll give us a new body, a new mind, and a new attitude toward life in general. Everything will change because of that. But remember, no forgiveness is involved here. There is no part that is needing forgiveness. Your body is your body, and your mind is your mind, and God will recreate it just like the blind man's eyes, and you will have a new life. So let's make sure we understand that. The first death is the result of evil. Hell is the result of guilt. What does evil need? Remembering the blind man's eyes, it needs recreation. What does sin need? It needs forgiveness. So sin needs forgiveness. Blindness needs healing. That's the lesson Jesus was trying to teach. Go to John chapter 9 with me. John 9 verse 41. Jesus is talking to some Pharisees here. And he said something very interesting to them. John 9, 41. If ye were blind, if you were truly ignorant, did not know, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, we know what's going on. We're fairly smart. Therefore, your sin remaineth. So notice that very carefully. If you are blind, meaning ignorant, not knowing, you have no sin no sin. If you say you see, you do understand, you know the difference between right and wrong, your sin remains. Way back in the early days of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, people who had lung problems were told by their doctors how to solve that problem. You go out, buy the best tobacco and pipe and smoke it regularly and your lungs will be healed. What do you think of that advice? Did some of our early Adventist pioneers follow that advice? Yes, they did. Because that's what the doctor told them to do. 
and they trusted their doctor. And uh, did it work out well for them, do you think? Was it evil that the doctors were prescribing? Yes, it was. It was a destructive power that was now going to work on, in their minds and in their bodies and make the problem worse, not better. But did our pioneers sin because they took that advice? Was it a time of darkness in that understanding of what causes lung problems and how to heal lung problems? So yes, it was evil, but there was no guilt involved at all. And no forgiveness was needed for that. So that's a part of the picture that we're talking about here. If you say you see, your sin remains. Turn with me to James 4.17. I think is the clearest text in all of the scripture on this subject. You decide for yourself. James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Remember the two issues? You need to know the difference between right and wrong. And then rebel and say, no, I'm not doing it your way, God. So to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Now to James chapter 1. Now we're going to look at temptation. There's a huge difference between temptation and sin that is really important for us to understand. Temptation and sin. And by the way, very few Christians know what that difference is. Make sure you do. All right, let's list the four parts that, of temptation that lead to sin. James 1.14, but every man is tempted. So the, the context is temptation. When he is drawn away of his own lust, the word lust means a fallen nature, pulling him downward and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So what are the four steps here? The first one is we're drawn, right? We're pulled by our fallen nature. Remember I said I don't need a devil to tempt me. I've got a fallen nature doing it all the time. So the pull, the drawing. And it is enticing, correct? It is attractive. We believe it will help us. And then what happens? What's the next step? Something is conceived, right? That wasn't there before. The conceiving word is a birth process. Something is being born that didn't exist before this time. And then the fourth step is sin. Sin. Then when lust, the pull of our fallen nature, has conceived, it bringeth forth death. So drawn, enticed, conceived, and sin. There is a difference, my friends, between temptation and sin. Praise God for that difference. You are not sinning because a thought crossed your head. You are not sinning because something came to you from who knows where. That's a temptation. That's a drawing of your fallen nature. That is pulling you to conceive something brand new for you, which is sin. All right? Let's go to one text in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. This is not just a New Testament teaching, but it isn't often talked about in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 18, verses 1 to 4. It's a very interesting little passage. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? What is that proverb? The fathers did wrong. They, uh, they disobeyed you. And we, their children, are, reap, are reaping the penalty for that. As I live, saith the Lord God. Ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Pretty clear, isn't it? Not fathers for sons, not sons for fathers, not children for Adam. Just the soul that sins, it shall die. I'm going to let you read the next three texts on your own. They talk about the difference between ignorance and light. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 306. It is inevitable that children should suffer from the consequences of parental wrongdoing. That's evil. But they are not punished for the parents' guilt, except as they participate in their sins. 
Those are the little blanks down there. Children are not punished for the parents' guilt unless they participate in their sins. Again, by choice, by choice. Turn to page three. I'm going to let you read the first half of the page on your own. Remember, this is for you to take home and review and think about because this subject, my friends, what is sin, makes everything different in the gospel. Depending on your answer to this question, what is sin, you will have one or the other of the two gospels that are floating around Christianity today. All right, halfway down the page. Halfway down page three, Gospel Workers 162. Light makes manifest and reproves the errors that were concealed in darkness. And as light comes, the life and character of men must change correspondingly to be in harmony with it. Sins that were once sins of ignorance because of the blindness of the mind can no more be indulged in without incurring guilt. Catch that again? There are things that are wrong and as things that should not be, but until the light comes, until knowledge from the Word of God comes to you, evil remains evil, and guilt is not in your future or in your present. But when the light comes and you make a choice to say no to God, that turns evil in our world and in our minds, in our fallen nature, into guilt. I'll let you read about the rest of them on page three. Turn to page four with me. Testimonies, volume five, 177, explains the difference between evil and guilt in a practical way. The sin of evil speaking begins with the cherishing of evil thoughts. Guile includes impurity in all its forms. An impure thought, what? Tolerated. An unholy desire, what? cherished and the soul is contaminated its integrity compromised let me ask you a question do you feel kind of contaminated when that thought comes out of nowhere you think and you weren't thinking about it but all of a sudden there it is staring you in your mind and you have to make a decision about where you're going to go with that thought are you going to cherish it or are you going to reject it which are you going to do that is the moment of decision. That is the moment of choice in which you choose yes or no to God's will and God's way. You make that choice. No one else can make that choice for you. No one else can make that choice against God except you. So the whole issue isn't temptation sin. No, it is not. And yet most Christians believe that yes, it is. Temptation is never sin. Let me read the rest of this paragraph. We read the first part of it. Every emotion and desire must be held in subjection to reason and conscience. Every unholy thought must be, when repelled? Instantly. No man can be forced to transgress. His own consent must be first gained. The soul must purpose the sinful act before passion can dominate over reason or iniquity triumph over conscience. Temptation however strong, is never an excuse for sin. He knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart, and he will help in every time of temptation. Have you fallen into sin? Then without delay, seek God for mercy and pardon. When David was convicted of his sin, he poured out his soul in penitence and humiliation before God. So yes, temptation can feel contaminating, but friends, go by the word of God as to what contaminates you, not by your feelings. They are not a safe guide. Go by God's word only. So again, the blanks there, the impure thought must be tolerated, the un unholy desire must be cherished before you participate in sin. Just a question. When Jesus comes, what is he going to recreate so you don't have to bother with it anymore at all? When Jesus comes, what is he going to recreate? Your body, your mind, but especially, especially your fallen nature. Won't it be great when you don't have to fight that anymore? When you don't have thoughts coming out of nowhere? When things don't just suddenly appear to your mind? Praise God, there will be a time when we will have the same attitudes and spirit that Adam had 
before he sinned. And Eve. God will put a new nature in us. But what goes straight to heaven? You take what to straight to heaven without any change? Character. You got it. Character. You take your life plans, you take your attitudes, you take your feelings, you take your belief in Jesus Christ, that goes straight to heaven. One thing is changed. Your fallen nature is changed. Your body is changed. That's changed at the second coming. But character is not changed at all. So I'd say it's a really good thing to work on character every day because that goes straight to heaven if we go to heaven. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 116, said the angel, If light comes, and that light is set aside or rejected, then comes condemnation and the frown of God. But before the light comes, there is no sin, for there is no light for them to reject. I just wonder, what do you think? Could the English language be any clearer on this subject? Let's read it again. If light comes and that light is set aside, then comes condemnation. Not when the, you are tempted. Not when it pulls at you. But when you say no to God. Before the light comes, there is no sin. Are the blanks that follow there. Before light comes, there is no sin. Won't there be a lot of people in heaven who have never, ever, ever kept the seventh day Sabbath, not even one time? And they never repented of breaking the fourth commandment, did they? Why is that? Because they did not sin. Yes, they broke a commandment in ignorance, but that is not sin. It's evil. It doesn't help things any. It doesn't help God's plan. It doesn't help us. But if we have no light on the subject, I hope and pray, and I'm thinking that you do too, there will be people in heaven that you will meet that you wonder about because they did not follow what you have found to be light and truth. I think of Martin Luther. I'm hoping to see him there. I'm hoping to sit down with him and talk with him of what he experienced. But he never kept the seventh day Sabbath, not even once. And he never asked forgiveness for breaking it. Even though one of his fellow preachers said to him, concerning Sunday, one is uneasy because men have instituted it. But apparently that didn't prick his conscience enough. That didn't compel the light to come through. We don't know. I hope and pray with all my heart that Martin Luther didn't reject the Seventh-day Sabbath. He simply didn't see that it was crucial as many, many others have not down through the centuries. They may have experienced evil, but they did not experience guilt. I love the next one, Review and Herald, March 27, 1888. There are thoughts and feelings suggested and aroused by Satan that annoy even the best of men. But if they are not cherished, if they are repulsed as hateful, the soul is not contaminated with guilt and no other is defiled by their influence. Now that's inspiration. That you can take to the bank. That is what sin is all about. If they are not cherished, if they are repulsed, the soul is not contaminated with guilt. The really important thing is a living, strong relationship with Jesus Christ all the way through. Okay. What have I just said today? Let's make sure you understand what I'm saying. Choosing sin is our responsibility, no one else's. It is not our parents' responsibility. It is not Adam's responsibility. Jesus paid for that. We cannot blame Adam for our weaknesses. Yes, we can blame him because we're not quite the way we should be, and we live in a world that's way off from where it should be. But we can't blame him for our guilt. That's our decision. Now, for those of you who might not have been here last night, here is what happens. It's easy to follow. If you believe definition A, that we are born sinners, then number one, Jesus can't take our fallen nature or that would make him a sinner too because he would be guilty just like us. 
So that means he has to take an unfallen nature. The gospel can only be justification, forgiveness, because we will be sinning till Jesus comes. As long as we have a fallen nature, we are sinning, actively sinning. So the gospel can only be justification, forgiveness. It can't be sanctification, overcoming. And the gospel can't even begin to talk about perfection of character. You can throw out just about half of the book of Revelation if you believe in definition A. There will not be a people at the very end of time standing up for God though the heavens fall. There will not be 144,000 in which God can say, take a look, Satan, if you want to see a generation living above and without sin. None of that can matter if you believe in definition A. But if you believe in definition B, that sin is always a choice, then Jesus can take bad equipment. He can be tempted in how many points like as we are? All points, from inside as well as from outside. He is tempted from, all, from his human nature, just like I am tempted from my human nature. All of this is part of Jesus Christ coming down the line as we are born. And then justification. Praise God for justification. What do you say? For forgiveness. But is there more? Is there a lot more to the gospel than forgiveness of a past sin? There's overcoming. There's victory. There's praising God for his power. The miracle of a new life. All of that is true. And perfection, it is God's most gracious gift he will ever give to human beings. You don't achieve perfection. He provides perfection. He is the one who will give you that gift if you are participating step by step in the process of renewal and obedience and faithfulness. It will be God's final and powerful gift. Let's just make sure we understand it. It's very simple. If sin is by nature, it is inevitable we must continue in sin. We will be sinning till Jesus comes. There will be no chance and no hope of overcoming that fallen nature. Therefore, the inevitability, inevitability of necessity rules out all responsibility. You're not responsible for sinning. That was programmed into you. You couldn't help it. You became a sinner by birth, and you remain a sinner until Jesus takes that nature away from you. You are sinning constantly, and that's just the way it is. If, however, sin is by choice, then we are responsible for the choices we make. It becomes that easy to understand. If sin is by choice, I'm responsible for bad choices. And so I can take that sin to the Lord, ask for forgiveness, and he will provide not only forgiveness, he will provide strength that I don't have. He will provide victory that I can't achieve. He will provide the answer if we let him. All right, I'm done talking about sin. But this is the crucial, the crucial subject. If we're amiss on this, Everything about the gospel will be different. And I lived in a time, I lived through the experience of Desmond Ford teaching at Pacific Union College right alongside me. And I've just shared with you part of Desmond Ford's gospel. He believed we're born sinners. He believed that Christ couldn't take our nature. He believed the gospel is only justification. And he believed that no perfection comes until Jesus comes. He believed all of those things as a good evangelical Christian believes them today. So I've talked to you about two different gospels based on two different definitions of sin. We're done talking about that. We're going to spend the rest of the day talking about the solution. And the solution, of course, is Jesus Christ. But friends, because of our misunderstanding of sin down through the centuries, we also have misunderstood who Jesus Christ was and how he was tempted. All points, like as we are, becomes a crucial subject for discussion. How was he tempted? So we're going to spend the rest of our afternoon and our evening talking about how Christ made the difference 
and how we can participate in that, how we don't have to live in a rebelling mode for the rest of our days on planet Earth. We don't have to live in guilt, even though we have to live in an evil world until Jesus comes. I think that's good news. You have to decide for yourself if that's good news for each one of us. And I will praise God for that. All right, that's our subject for this afternoon. That's where we will pick it up, pick it up, and we will discuss these things in more in depth. Our closing hymn is number 340, Jesus Saves, number 340. Again, for coming this morning, and there is a fellowship lunch if you'd like to stay by and then join us for the afternoon. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath day. We are thankful for the opportunity we have to come together in fellowship, to be reminded of your word and the power of your word in our lives. And we pray that as we go through the remainder of this day, we will be drawn closer to you that you will become first and foremost in all that we do. So bless each one as we leave this place today. May your spirit live in our hearts. May you guide in all that we do. May we be a reflection of Jesus to the world around you. And when you come, may we be able to look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for being with us today. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name, amen.